Okay, I am here with Oliver Jaw. Oliver, thank you for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it. Um, would you like to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you for inviting me on. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Oliver Ja. I'm a master's student in international relations who uh, currently resides in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, my research interests are uh, basically Japan and North Korea relations. Um, besides academic stuff, I'm the social media editor for nknews.org, uh, which is a specialist site uh, dedicated to coverage of everything North Korea. And uh, yeah, I've uh, basically, if you count the first time I came to Japan, and now I've been here for almost three years altogether. Wow. Well, uh, you're, you've certainly had quite a um, interesting journey getting here. So um, just to kind of give some background, some uh, about what really kind of sparked your interest in even coming to Japan in the first place, you know, like when did that start? Sure. Uh, well, I'm already from a East Asian background. So mm. my dad is Chinese and uh, that's always had, you know, given me an interest in East Asia, everything that sort of happens in this region. Right. But um, I never really grew up speaking Chinese or anything. And uh, my mother is actually Lebanese Canadian. So she was born in Canada and her family, they're all from uh, Lebanon or have Lebanese ancestry. So I've always grown up with a, uh, you know, multicultural background, a lot of different influences. So I've always been interested in other cultures, other countries to begin with. But um, for Japan specifically, it's because when I was in high school, I'm a, and still am a big movie fan. And uh the films of, you know, Akira Kurosawa, Masa, mm. Masaki Kobayashi, uh, Kinji Fukasaku, that, those types of directors, they really appealed to me at the time, especially if you're a budding cinephile. And um, at the time, I kind of figured, well, you know, it would be nice maybe to know a little bit of Japanese just to, you know, kind of enhance the film experience. So right. I studied that as just as a hobby for like, you know, uh, about a year to two years. I started off with Pimsleur, if you're familiar with that. Uh, oh, yeah. That audio, <laughs> Pim audio Pimsleur, yes. Yeah, it's, it's very dry. It's very boring, but it actually, yeah. it's pretty, pretty effective if you stick to it. And yeah. 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 Um, Pimsleur, that, that's the, uh, where they do the kind of the reverse speaking uh, yes. method, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where they, you sound, start... they sound the word out from like the last, uh, the last mora or the last syllable, and then they move backwards. And then mm -hmm it's all conversational. There's no, you're not supposed to take any notes and it's just a one thirty minute lesson a day. So right. there were, there's 90 lessons and I think they might've even expanded it to like 120 or 150 at this point. But I did the bit, the basic 90 lessons. And that was like the first for basic conversation. I stuck wow. You're, you're a trooper then. I, I could barely get through about 10 of those. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, I mean, when I was studying Japanese, um, I did it on my, on my own too. Um, unfortunately I, I didn't start until I actually came here. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, I was late to the game on that, but um, no, I, I, I tried several different methods of, of studying and uh, Pimsleur was one of the things I tried throwing at the wall that didn't quite stick, but. Uh, yeah, well, uh, so mm. that was because uh, it was in high school. So there weren't any Japanese classes right. uh, at my high school. And so, um, yeah, I did that for two years. And then when I got to university, you know, trying to figure out, figure out what I wanted to do, what I wanted to major in. And mm -hmm. uh, because I'd like Japanese so much and there's a Japanese major, I went to the University of Pittsburgh, which has okay. a fantastic language program, not just for Japanese, but for Chinese, Korean or more okay. different languages. So mm. I figured, well, take a, take some classes here and uh, try going for a Japanese major while you're figuring things out. I wanted to do Japanese and business, a dual major. So the okay. idea was mm. that, you know, business is a very, you know, vague, broad field, gives you a lot of opportunities. And then right. Japanese is what I actually like doing i like doing that for fun but i liked it so much that i wanted to actually like stick to it and to actually you know get as high level of proficiency as possible and to actually study abroad in japan right right and and what happened along the way was so i'm so I'm, I'm good at stuff like you know english and like history you know writing mm. that kind of thing that's my strengths but math absolutely terrible can't <laughs> <laughs> same we're in the yeah. same club man yeah yeah <laughs> i like i barely passed the first course of algebra and then mm. uh, i failed business calculus which basically told me okay well you know mm. this is basically the threshold so if i can't get past this i think probably should choose something besides business so right. i had like a bit of a you know as most college students do you know what am i supposed to do with my life what am i going to major in yeah. and uh, i figured well what did, what actually makes you happy what actually uh you know motivates you to keep going and that was japanese and uh because you know when you're learning a language it's like exercise or it's like you know learning an instrument you have to stick to what you have to actually mm -hmm. like you know commit to it so mm -hmm. to me that gave me like a type of purpose to to keep going and then because my university had such a you know expansive study abroad program with not just japan many different countries i figured well go to japan for a year see how things work out see what you wanted to do and i was very lucky actually because 
um, I worked at the East Asian Study Center at my mm-hmm. university as just like an office intern. So doing their like uh, office affairs and all that. Right. But they also had a program where you could actually do an internship in Japan. So cool. on top of like the uh, year study abroad program, I also did the uh, internship program. So I went, I was able to go for 15 months for oh. the first time, which is much longer than the average uh, student study abroad. Uh, study right. Abroad. Right. So when you were studying Japanese, like, um, did would you say your ultimate goal was to just to get to Japan or did you have like a, like an end goal? Like this is what um, like, like, for example, taking the JLPT or did you have a certain goal you were trying to hit or were you just enjoying the, the journey of, uh, of studying? Yeah, it, it was a little bit of both. So mm-hmm. um, I kind of like figured maybe I would want to be like that. So I know English teaching is the popular, uh, the popular route for most people, but I, I realized early on just doing for research, that's mostly just a stepping stone. It's very, it's yep. really not a career for most people, unless you mm-hmm. get an actual teaching certificate or you go to like a full time staff at a high school or university mm-hmm. or what have you. So that I didn't want to do. So I figured, okay, what about translation? What about something, uh, you know, uh, something so creative with that kind of thing, because I ended right. up, so when I stopped doing the business degree, I did an English uh, major, which became a minor. So I had that under my belt, but then also for translation, it's very touch and go. You really need to have a lot of industry connections. You really need to know mm-hmm. the right people and you know, the fun stuff like manga or anime or like games and stuff, like those are very competitive to get those jobs and they actually don't pay as well as something like law or medicine. Right like that so Hmm. yeah that's back to the drawing board on that but then uh, at the same time i ended up having an interest in uh, north korea and for like you know geopolitical affairs and the north korea stuff is because my uh, dad lived through the cultural revolution in china i always had uh, an interest in these uh you know communist countries you know the struggles that a lot of these people went through and north korea is really the only country that's left on earth that's like you know what my dad went through what my family went through so right right yeah Yeah, north korea is a it's it's really a an enigma now it's a it's quite a Quite an interesting topic. Yeah, we, we can talk more about yeah. that. Actually, um, <clears throat> a few months ago, I talked, I, I chatted with um, uh, Steve Miller, who works for um, VOA. Um, yes. uh, are you familiar with him? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's he's really familiar with um, the Korea topic as well. So um, it was it's it's just a fascinating uh, topic to to learn about with uh, with North Korea. So <clears throat> I can see especially with your, uh, your family history, how um, that could be a, a, you know, like a very, um, you just go down the rabbit hole and, and, yeah. and stuff. So, and I, I'm sure you're familiar with um, uh, Michael Malice, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 Have you read Dear Reader? Yeah. Dear Reader was actually one of like the earliest books I read on North mm-hmm. Korea. And okay. I actually, I highly recommend that for people who want to get into, get into the subject. It's a, uh, right. it's, it's not really a satire. It's more of like a farce on Kim Jong-il's uh, life, you know, how he, right. He was there for the for mostly basically the whole founding of North Korea. So mm-hmm. it uh, gives some really good insight into you know how that country was started, what the mentality is among the people, how they view their leaders. So and then and then of course from that book I read other texts like you know uh, there's the real North Korea by Andrei Lankov is very good. Uh, Nothing to Envy by uh, Barbara Demick. All all of these different like texts uh, that really gave me you know I'm always interested in reading new books about North Korea and. Right. Uh, you know, last year I landed a job at NK News just part time to do their their social media. So mm-hmm. um, that's been a learning experience, too. But, you know, to go back to the, you know, original uh, impetus to, mm-hmm. to, to do North Korea, it's also because it's tied to Japan in, in many ways, right. many, many often sad and tragic ways, because, um, you know, the abduction issue, uh, which I'm sure that, you know, a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with, where North Korea systematically abducted Japanese nationals in the 1970s and the 1980s. That's a very sore political point between both countries. It's a very sad tragedy for, you know, a lot of Japanese. Uh, the public sentiments are very much on the sides of the families. So that was also the, stu- the subject of my uh, thesis for my undergraduate years. And oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to just uh, analyzing that topic. And then that that basically inspired me to go on into international relations to, you know, look at the goal, the relationships between various countries, and especially because North Korea is and I think will continue to be one of the most important policy, uh, po- foreign policy problems in uh, international society. I think, uh, you know, I chose the right path. And uh, I'm glad that I was able to come to that. To that right, conclusion. right. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly. Uh, uh, you're right. Um, uh, we can we can get back to North Korea in a little bit. Um, I just uh, the one one area that uh, I find fascinating about the abduction issue is um, how they responded to it, how the North Korean government responded to it. You know, it was, you know, just denial, denial, denial until they 
needed something and then they were just like ah yeah well uh <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, and the thing is it's so yeah uh, to people unfamiliar with that in 2002 there was a summit in Pyongyang between then prime minister Junichiro Koizumi and uh, Kim Jong Il mm. and uh, basically in the the 90s Japan was trying to like normalize relations with North Korea they were trying to um you know try to make the, these countries like you know be get back together after like you know decades of you know post war stuff and you know conflict with South Korea Japan was really hoping to um sort of you know, bridge the gap and try to come together. But the biggest problem was, as we said, the, the abduction issue. So the Japanese government, they knew that this was happening. Uh, there were a lot of people that didn't. They said it was a conspiracy theory that there's no proof of this happening. But there were people in the Japanese government that knew. Like Shinzo Abe, when he was a very young lawmaker, he was actually one of the first uh, voices to bring attention to this problem. Mm. So throughout the 1990s, you had these behind the scenes negotiations, which resulted in this summit. And so Koizumi was expecting to be some kind of agreement, some kind of like, you know, uh, re resolution to this issue. And so what Kim Jong-il did was he said, uh, yeah, we actually did abduct these people. But, you know, it wasn't up to me, actually. It was, you know, uh, zealous people who, you know, they kind of like, you know, believe too much into like, you know, the ideology. And so they've been appropriately punished and, you know, will return anybody that's still alive. Well, right. the thing is, the list of people that they said were still alive and the ones that the Japanese government had, they didn't match. And right. what North Korea actually did was they announced like people that weren't even on the Japanese list. So that kind of like admitted to the fact there were more people that were stolen than before. Mm. So five people were returned back, but there's still people in, in North Korea. Right. Yeah. And, and the um, not only Japanese, but uh, th there's stories of uh, American soldiers defecting to North Korea and, I met you know, be, being yeah. uh, you have you, you met. Yeah. Um, I met, okay. Charles I met Charles Jenkins on uh, Sato Island, actually. Oh, uh, man. That, yeah. Three months before he passed away. That's uh, OK. Let's let's get into that here here soon, because um, that, that's fast. I, I actually did not know that you that you met him. So that that's fascinating. Um, yeah. So like his story, like he was given a, <laughs> a one of these Japanese abductees as a wife. You know, they were kind of forced together. But there's their story is quite, quite sweet in a way, you know, yes, because they, know, they yeah. ended up actually falling in love with each other yeah, you know and having having children and everything mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. yeah so uh well anyways you see that with that soldier that you mentioned actually mm -hmm. so one of the japanese that was uh, repatriated back to japan from north korea was uh, soga hitomi who was the wife of this uh, american soldier who defected to uh, north korea or crossed the dmz in the 1960s and uh so what happened was with this American soldier, there was him and there was, I think, five or six others throughout like the 60s and I think up until the mid 80s who at one point or another crossed the DMZ for various reasons. So uh, Jen so this is Charles Jenkins. He claimed that he was afraid of being defected, of, of being sent to uh, Vietnam because this was in the late 1960s. America was ramping up its support in the Vietnam War. So he didn't want to go to Vietnam. So he crossed the border into North Korea. And what he claims was he would go to the Russian embassy who would then repatriate him back to America. But that didn't happen because for North Korea, that's propaganda material. We can use, so look, right. another American soldier has come to our side so we can use this to like promote our ideology. Right. And he ended up staying there for almost 40 years which you know yeah that that's got to be a crazy existence to be an american living in north korea for that long you know like yeah, um, yeah. so um i mean yeah you you met him how did how did you set that up or how did you come to meet him and and how was it like like you know speaking to to him and like he he must have had so many you know stories to, to sure. tell you know so, so what happened was like after his wife was repatriated back to uh, japan he came with her two years later that was a very long negotiation between koizumi and kim jong-il so these five japanese abductees were returned back to japan but their family members were still left in north korea so that included jenkins and you know uh spouses and children so they were able to re be returned you know to about two years after that so what jenkins did he moved to sado island which is a very it's a it's one of Japan's, I think, biggest islands, actually, you know, apart mm -hmm. from the four main ones. It's right. like off the coast of uh, Niigata Prefecture. Niigata, it's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually, you know, quite difficult to get to even for normal Japanese people because it's like a, there's a ferry. It's like three, three hours, very slow moving, only a few times throughout the day. But it is a popular tourist destination for the people who, want, who, who end up going there. And Jenkins, he was basically the greeter at the Sado Island History Museum. He was famous for selling uh, sembe and uh, you know other uh, knickknacks to uh, to tourists, and because of his story as being you know one of the the only American soldier who was able to leave North Korea of the the few that defected, he basically was a small local celebrity. Everybody knew who he was. So, 
Um, it was actually kind of a bit of a gamble, though, because he didn't work every single day at that museum. He only worked on certain days. And because of how long it takes to get to that to that uh, this remote museum in a remote, remote island in a remote prefecture in Japan, I was a bit concerned, like maybe I might, I might not even get there. And so the, as, as the museum is still open, it could be closed when I get there. But right. thankfully, he was there. Uh, he was actually about to leave, but I was able to like, uh, you know, talk to him just right before yeah. he left. We took a picture together. Right. right. Uh, spoke for, you know, because it's the end of his shift, so we had more time to talk. So we spoke for about like 20 minutes about uh, various different topics, you know, what his life was like, how he feels. And uh, yeah, I uh, it, he actually ended up being the subject of my first uh, article for NK News. The okay. article was written uh, that was written in like 2019. So two years after we met, but I had written, taken notes down. I had like uh, remembered everything he told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's that's great. Uh, I'll I'll have to go back and, and read that now. Um, that's uh, uh, his story and the other soldiers too. But his story in particular was was really fascinating when I when I read about him. So yeah, there, uh, there were plans actually to make to turn it into a movie, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that ever went through. But you know, it, it feels like something that would be like you know great for like Hollywood or for like Japan because you have this like romance story of two people from two completely different cultures that are mm -hmm. in this situation that they don't want to be in, but it's their love through and their children that gets them through the situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it has all the makings of um, of a Hollywood movie. I mean, and and he's an experienced actor, right? He 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 starred in propaganda films in North yeah. Korea as well. Well, so. well, the thing is, so it's funny you mentioned that. So he, he was. Uh, his accent, so he's from North Carolina, so his accent was so strong that when he was speaking English, he had to be dubbed over by one of the other defectors who had like <laughs> less, <laughs> less of a strong accent than him. And yeah. uh, the, the, the funny thing is, if you look at pictures of him when he left North Korea, he was only, I think, in his like mid-60s, but he looked like he was like 20 years older. Mm -hmm. And I, that's, I think, just because of all the drinking, all the cigarettes, and, you know, just the stress of living in North Korea <laughs> for such a long time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess that's uh, something you got to do to, to cope living in North Korea is, you know, uh, I guess the booze and the, and the cigarettes, yeah. you know, but, but and, the thing is like, you know, the North Koreans, like their, uh, their handlers and everything, they, they, you know, of course would give them that stuff. Cause that keeps them complacent that, right. you know, you know, keeps them like in check. And uh, of course these, you know, Americans, like in the, especially in the beginning, they weren't mingling with the average North Korean. They were like in a compound right. that mm -hmm. was, you know, far away from like, you know, downtown Pyongyang. And then eventually it's, it's all, it's almost like, you know, being, it basically is being a hostage essentially where the trust sort of slowly builds over time. And then there's even a bit of Stockholm syndrome, I think. Cause yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. you can't, wasn't one of the other soldiers, correct me if I'm wrong, he was kind of like a snitch on the others as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that was a Dresnok. And so he also mm -hmm. came from a similarly like poor background from Jenkins where the thing is he crossed the DMZ because like he didn't like being told what to do by the American army because he wanted oh. to <laughs> he wanted to go down to like, you know, the village while like, you know, where all the soldiers were partying. He had like, a, I think a Korean girlfriend who was like, I think uh, one of like the uh, prostitutes, you know, provided to the soldiers, but he was really attached to this woman, but he couldn't see her. He couldn't like, you know, do what he wanted. So he basically just, you know, flipped them off and like cross the hit the road in the middle of the day. And he like oh. just ran across the DMZ and then. The thing is, there's conflicting reports to like, you know, how much he actually believes in the propaganda. So Jenkins says that he, him and like none of them ever believed in anything. But if you watch this documentary called Crossing the Line, which uh, is mostly about Dresnok, he comes across as, you know, buying into all the propaganda, praising mm. the dear leaders, all the Juche ideology and all that. But with North Korea, you have no idea how much of this is actually staged and how much of this is genuine. It's genuine, right? Yeah, because he probably says these, it's survival, you know, yeah. um, you know, just uh, he's looking out for his own his own skin you know yeah. so and also um, from his from his perspective too i mean he never had a full family he uh was from a very like broken ha background and north korea even though from you know you and me would be hell on earth to live there hmm. he was given a wife actually multiple wives after they passed away he's had multiple children and he passed away a few years ago you know surrounded by his loved ones essentially yeah. so it's a very strange strange story and uh if you read the book and you look into the more details, there's there's things that he did to the other defectors that I don't think reflects very well on him. But, you know, it, it's far more than, you know, just like, you know, these people, they, they betrayed their country to move for ideological reasons. And I right. think a lot of people misconstrue what like these stories actually are. Mm -hmm. And and these guys were, were quite young when they did it, too. So, you know, people do things in their yeah. youth that uh, um, they later look back on and be like, oh that that wasn't the best choice was it you know i mean it, it, passions yeah. you know get in the way but um well i'm writing i'm writing a piece on otto warmbier which i'm sure you're familiar with as oh, the yeah. american soldier who was mm -hmm. uh, you know, not soldier the american uh, college student who was uh, who went to north korea about five years ago actually uh, this mm -hmm. month and uh, he was detained for stealing a poster allegedly and then uh you know one thing led to another and he came back to america in a comatose state where he passed away and 
he was 22 when that happened and I'm 23 years old. So stuff like that, it definitely, uh, you know, resonates with me. Right, right. So what I was going to ask is, I mean, right now, America, well, uh, along with uh, coronavirus restrictions too, but even before that, um, Americans were banned from uh, from traveling from to North Korea. Um, but before that, had you had any interest in actually visiting? Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, you probably had that that had crossed sure. your mind at some point, right? Yeah, well, it did. But so that happened actually because of auto warm beer. They like prevented Americans from going because of what happened to him. And that mm. ban is still in place. It's been renewed every year since I think 2017. So technically when I first came to Japan, which was uh, May 2017, there was a brief period for me to like go there because especially I'm closer now than ever, but just logistically it wouldn't work out. I didn't have that kind of money. I didn't have right. like the, the time or like, you know, the will to go there. I didn't really have like it wasn't the opportunity wasn't right and then shortly after that the ban happened and I couldn't go but mm. the closest thing I was able to do was go to the DMZ in in Panmunjom mm -hmm. I went to South Korea for a few days in uh, yeah Chris around Christmas 2017 and so yeah took some nice photos and uh, even now actually you can't go to the the DMZ anymore I think because of just corona stuff so right right the so, timing was good for that at least and so I'm glad I had that experience yeah and and before the ban was in place you basically had to go to North Korea through like a um there's some sort of a company in china that would yeah. that would mm -hmm. like like well, a tour like a tour company or something right yeah there's various there's actually various tour groups that go to uh, north korea but they basically all go through china so either you mm -hmm. go to beijing and there's one flight i think a week that goes there and so it's based around that or there's also some trains that also allows you to go across the chinese border to north korea but mm. right now actually north korea not just americans they've closed off their border completely they actually have the most strictest uh well, on the outside, they said they're the most strictest COVID-19 measures in the world. They're claiming zero positive cases because of how successful the measures have been, mm -hmm. which, you know, is obviously not true. There's very little evidence to suggest that. But in terms of letting people in, though, that actually has been successful. Even like foreign workers that are in North Korea, the few that exist, if they leave North Korea, they can't go back. So it's going to leave many construction projects like in limbo for an unknown amount of time. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the, who, who knows what the real number of, of cases in North Korea are, but I mean, with you know, they, with their, you know, um, strict measures that they've taken in general, I'm sure it's, uh, it's not as high as, um, as some other countries, you know? Yeah. And, well, what's, what's funny is they say suspected cases. So they say there's yeah. been thousands of suspected cases, but no zero confirmed cases. Right. So that, that it, it they, uh, they kind of betray their, uh, their, their true, uh, their true numbers in that, in that case then. Um, now I've, yeah, no, North Korea is, is, is it's it's a very interesting um, place. I've seen some documentaries about you know, like the daily lives of, of people there, and actually there was a there's a guy on YouTube that I don't know how he was able to do this. I, th I think he's from Indonesia, but he did like hidden cam um, videos, like where he would go through um, supermarkets and like just be you know. Um, people on the street ordering like ice cream and stuff like that and just day-to-day -day life North Korea in, in this little hidden camera and I'm not sure how he was able to upload it probably if he returned to to his home country he would upload these videos but uh, that 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 gives you just a real sense of um, of what daily life is like there beyond the propaganda that is presented to the world. Have you yeah. seen those videos? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I'm familiar with who you're talking about. He, he's either I think Indonesian. He might even be Singaporean or mm -hmm. something. I'm not. It's Southeast Asian Asian country. But right. well, besides him, I, I interviewed this uh, researcher named uh, Aramaki Masayuki, where he's basically been going to North Korea for 20 years since the mid 90s, and. He has a YouTube channel called uh, Aramaki Project, where similar to what, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, he uploads like these just videos of daily life in Pyongyang, you know, restaurants, streets, parks, that sort of thing. And so I, I interviewed him for NK News last year, and I was asking him, how are you allowed to film all this without any kind of, you know, backlash or any kind of control? And he said, it's because because I don't get into politics. I don't film anything that would get me into trouble all i'm doing is showing what life is like in pyongyang and that's actually you know they like that because yeah, pyongyang is the yeah. best city and especially so there's this misconception of how poor north korea is don't get me wrong it's a very poor country especially if you go into the countryside but if you go to pyongyang especially in the since kim jong-un took over and towards the end of kim jong-il there's tons of renovation projects. They've really expanded their city to make it as close to, you know, a modern city as possible. Now, realistically speaking, it's probably more closer to like, you know, a mid-sized Chinese city in terms of like, you know, standard of living. But mm. if you live in Pyongyang, you're among the elites. You probably have a very privileged life and a privi privileged background. Right, right. Uh, the, the people that live in Pyongyang are, are part of the upper crust of, of, 
uh, yeah. North Korean society, of course, you know, the government jobs and scientists and whatnot. So, um, yeah, and, and North Korea kidnapped more than just Japanese. They would, they've kidnapped South Korean, yes. um, like a, a director. Yes, right? uh, yeah. Shin, Sang, Shin Sang Ok and uh, Choi Eun Hee, which, which is this uh, uh, South Korean actress who was actually his estranged wife. So mm. he, they were like up, uh, up, abducted or like, you know, kind of like lured to North Korea under false pretenses at separate times. And they were sort of remarried in North Korea and they made movies for Kim Jong Il. Very interesting. I wonder how um, that reunion went. So <laughs> probably, <laughs> I mean, it, they're familiar yeah. with each other. So pro probably in order to get by, they, they, yeah. You know. The thing is like, you hear about stuff like that. It sounds like a spy film or like a novel or whatever. Mm. It doesn't sound like oh, abductions, you know, you know, making movies for like a, for a dictator and all that. Like, it doesn't sound like something like a normal country would do, but I really maintain that North Korea isn't a normal country. It's the only right. country in the world that has that level of totalitarianism and control mm. over its people yeah. and not just its own people. As you mentioned with the abductions, they're trying to like, you know, get other people and try to get other people involved, but it's really only Japan that's made it into a political issue. The abductions, the yeah. other countries, countries for whatever reason they don't really bring it up and you know it's especially concerning that um, South Korea under Moon mm -hmm. Jae-in he's really doing as much as he can to like appease Kim Jong-un and to like you know have rebuilt inter-Korean relations but is it isn't probably... his family um sorry to interrupt isn't his family originally from North Korea or, or am I wrong on that 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 might be true but I just mm -hmm. know that um, I don't know the, the full detail of Moon Jae-in's background okay. but he, he was a human rights lawyer under uh, you know uh, decades ago and he was very uh, big on human rights under the Park Chung-hee administration so he's always had like a, an opposition to just the conservatism of South Korea he calls himself a progressive but what a lot of I think maybe our uh, American viewers especially wouldn't understand is like progressivism or like you know left-wing stuff in like South Korea they're more nationalist than this you know the conservative of South Koreans because to the left-wing people in South Korea Korean nationalism is both Korea's united together against mm -hmm. like you know everything else mm -hmm. so that's a big part of Moon's ideology interesting yeah um I, I was unaware of that too that's um yeah Pete especially Americans you know talking about the political ideologies it's um uh, they, they they a lot of Americans tend to assume the rest of the world is similar to their way of thinking both sides you know like yeah liberal is this conservative is this but it's really it, you know it's very dynamic even in for example the uk or um you know countries that are familiar to americans it's it's still just you know different dynamics at play you know yeah. and um or like in japan for example um there are there really is just one um major political party here that's that's been in power uh minus a few times but um all the minor parties have just you know, you know, very nuanced um, positions, you know, so. Yeah, but, but even to add to what you said, but the, the major party, which is the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, which mm. is funny, welcome to Japanese politics, where liberal democratic actually means center right, uh, right. <laughs> conservative, yeah. but because it's such a big party, there's a lot of factions within the LDP. And those factions okay. have basically since uh, 1955, when the party took over, they've always competed against each other for power. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and know, splinter Koizumi parties is, and whatnot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Koizumi, so Junichiro Koizumi from like 20 years ago, he's very much of the neoliberalist school, where he wanted to, you know, uh, privatize everything. He was very big of pushing for privatization of the post office. But Abe, and he's part of the new conservative movement, he basically is much more about, you know, constitutional reform mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, having a, safety, a secure safety net. And for a lot of, you know, especially our American, like Republican viewers, maybe, or conservatives saying safety net, that's what do you mean? Conservatives shouldn't be talking about a safety net. But that's because, you know, you go to the, uh, the Tories, you go to like, you know, right wing parties in other countries, there are tons of, you know, right wing parties that support a safety net. It's just to like what degree and how it's handled that they disagree right. with like uh, other left-wing parties right right and um yeah so it's um it, it's interesting that the politics just um is, is very um unique of, of course you know country by country it varies um one thing i, I wanted to uh kind of touch back on was you know in regards to um north korea is so regardless of what's been going on with the current U.S. president, in in you know recent news, um, compared to previous presidents in the U.S., how they've handled North Korea, Donald Trump was very different in his hand his approach. Yes, even from the beginning to his his meetings, which were historic with Kim Jong Un. Right, so. Um, do you th one one question is was that overall helpful for 
relations between North Korea and America and, and subsequently the rest of the world. And now that Trump is on his way out and Joe Biden's coming in, how will that change? Uh, as we know, recent news, um, Kim Jong-un has uh, now declared America the, the biggest um, enemy of North Korea <laughs> yet again. So um, it seems like uh, we might be reverting in, you know, in relations with them. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, well, I think what people need to remember is that so these meetings between Kim Jong Un and uh, Donald Trump, yes, they were historic, but it wasn't like the first time at all that America came close to meeting with like a North Korean leader. In the '90s, okay. uh, Bill Clinton he pushed for a very similar approach to try to normalize relations with North Korea. They signed what was called the Agreed Framework, where North Korea said it would uh, suspend its nuclear program and uh, we would provide them with light water reactors so they could, you know, as a substitute for nuclear power, uh, we would give them food aid and we would reduce sanctions, and so then North. Korea would try to demilitarize or denuclearize, but you know that didn't work out either. They were still like you know doing their Iranian enrichment behind the backs of America, yeah. and uh, then it resorted back to hostility. And then now you have the, the second cycle where once again you know the chance for diplomacy comes back, and I think it's because for Donald Trump especially because he doesn't really understand, you know, the whole nuances of the situation. He basically ignored every taboo that other previous leaders had about engaging with North Korean leaders where he just said, yeah, you know, let's try it. Let's talk to Kim Jong-un and see, see what happens. But yeah. the problem with that is he underestimated, you know, what North Korea actually wanted. And so my view that has, you know, evolved over time is now that I think America needs to stop asking North Korea for denuclearization because it's not going to happen. Right. There is no reason for North Korea to get rid of its nukes, especially after they see they've seen what America's done to Libya, to like, you know, <laughs> where yeah. like for Libya, where basically Gaddafi <laughs> did what the U.S. said. Yeah, OK, we'll get rid of the, uh, the nuclear weapons. We'll denuclearize. And then, you know, the U.S. is backing, re you know, revolutionaries that like, uh, are, you know, be beating them on the street and, like, you know, executing him in public and all that exactly so yeah. that's that yeah. that is what you know kim jong and the kim's the kim family fears the most they care about their grip on power the most so you know talking to the u.s and all that um they want normalized relations with america because because they, it's a security guarantee it's a guarantee that america won't attack north korea that there won't be a war between them mm -hmm. and now i think agreement or no agreement it's very unlikely that america or north korea will go to war just because the cost is too great and there's very little benefit for washington to do that right so yeah so in terms of, you know, but in terms of like uh, Donald Trump meeting with Kim, that could have been an opportunity for, you know, things to get better, but it's a very long process that's going to take decades. And because, you know, both sides couldn't come to a, an agreement of, you know, how that should start off, it went back to what it was like as if there was basically no summits at all. And it ended up more just being a sort of thing for the cameras where, you know, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, they had a photo opportunity. Hmm. And, you know, that makes Kim, you know, have all this propaganda for his side saying, yeah, you see, I met with the president of the United States and, um, this is, you know, legitimizing my country. And, you know, it shows that we actually do have a chance with like, you know, talking to the American imperialists. Though, interestingly enough, when those uh, summits happened, they toned down uh, anti-American propaganda. Right. So yeah, they wanted yeah. to try to like, you know, rehabilitate themselves that, you know, like this, this is going in a better direction that you know, the dear leader has solved it. But because those summits didn't turn out well, now, as you mentioned, they're going back to the hostile rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And because Joe Biden has explicitly called Kim Jong-un a thug, he's criti uh, publicly criticized Trump for meeting with Kim Jong-un, it's very unlikely that Biden is going to meet with Kim unless, you know, the circumstances are completely right. And, you know, he actually feels like he can get headway on denuclearization. But right. as I've said, I don't think denuclearization is the path, the realistic path that the U.S. can go down. Right. Um, yeah. So with North, with that, um, do you ever see, at least possibly in our lifetimes, the reunification of a of Korea and if that were to happen what happens to the population of the north suddenly having to integrate into mm -hmm. a modern society you know yeah well, that, that's, only... that's 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 got to be a shock to so many people you know yeah well the only way reunification can happen is if the kims just disappear or like you mm -hmm. know for deposed because there is no possible scenario where the kims are still in power and that north and south korea are reunited so, you know, a lot of people try to compare this to East Germany and West Germany during the Cold War, where, mm. you know, quite seriously, in our, in our lifetime, are we going to see, you know, these two countries put together? Well, 
that's because the Soviet Union fell apart. That's because, I mean, because the Berlin Wall was torn down and because like, you know, the systems of power that were in place that were, you know, keeping East Germany down, those systems no longer existed. And also with integration, the economic gap between East and West Germany was big, but nowhere near as big as North and South Korea. Right. So the average North Korean knows that South Korea is a richer country than North Korea. But what the average North Korean doesn't understand is how much of a gap that is. I mean, yeah. there's a saying that like, you know, a poor janitor in South Korea is still like, you know, making more money than, you know, the average like North Korean citizen outside of Pyongyang. And, you know, for that to happen, you know, the Kims have to go away. And like, as I said, the Kims, Kim Jong-un, his biggest concern is his control on power. And so mm. that's what's preventing Korean reunification right for the biggest part. Yeah. And in speaking of power there, I mean, um, how, how, how credible is it that his, um, his, his sister is um, being either being groomed for to take over or there's some sort of power play going on i mean because from from what i've heard um in terms of the kim's uh, the siblings that they are the closest you know yes. like uh, the the other siblings you know obviously <laughs> kin uh, the nam he he was uh, you know assassinated so uh, yes. um but the these two seem to be the closest but um how realistic is it that the the younger sister is mm -hmm. takes over in, in a yeah. sense. Well, it's difficult to say because mm. there's never been a female North Korean leader. There are right. there are female party members uh, there who are in actually pretty good positions of power, but it's, you know, unprecedented for there to be like a female, you know, head of state for everything. But I'm, I'm sure that Kim would like prefer his sister to take over compared to like, you know, a general or like someone that's not part of his family, just so the Kim bloodline can continue on. Right. But he also has children too. They're, they're mm -hmm. infants at this point, essentially. They're not, they're, and I, I have no doubt that, you know, as soon as they're probably even now, you know, their education, they are being groomed to like, you know, take over one day or to be indoctrinated into that ideology because they don't want to have a situation like you mentioned with Kim Jong-nam where he's free to travel the world and it becomes, you know, uh, corrupted by Western influences. And he's trying to sneak into Tokyo Disneyland and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and for that reason, actually, he was actually pretty popular with Japanese people because, not, you know, a lot of people said if he takes over, you know, maybe North Korea could turn itself around. But right. yeah, no, I mean, uh, I find it a bit, bit concerning, as I'm sure you remember about like two years ago, the Western media had this fascination with Kim Yo-jong, like saying, yeah. oh, yeah, she like sassed Mike Pence, gave, gave him like a side eye and, you know, she's going to, you know, bring reform to North Korea and everything. And to me, that's just a very, you know, low level understanding of the situation, I think. I think that like, you know, if there's nobody, there are multiple candidates in succession who could uh, take over people who are like, you know, top generals or top officials. And that would basically guarantee that the system continues. But what Kim wants the most is for his own family to continue. They want that bloodline to continue. Right, right. Yeah, I can keep it all in the family, so to speak. So, yeah. So um, yeah, it's just, again, just there's so 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 much to, um, to North Korea that's just fascinating. So it's, um, it'll be interesting to see how it, goes on now from um from from this year you know yeah so. and I'm, I'm very lucky too because i come out like at a time i'm like i said i'm 23 years old and in my lifetime i guarantee that there'll be many changes with north korea even if mm -hmm. there's reunification doesn't happen in my lifetime i think we are going to see you know uh, a lot of like how they control things and how they do things that will change over time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so, so let's go back to to your experience coming to japan so you um when you first came to Japan, you said it was uh, 2017. Is that, is that correct? Yes, yeah, May so, 2017. So had you had visited any time before on vacation or was this your first time stepping foot? In, that was in the Japan? first time stepping foot. And it was actually, I think the might've even been the first time I like traveled anywhere by myself too. Uh, you know, not the family. Yeah. So yeah. I would have been uh, 19 years old. 19. So as a 19 year old stepping foot in a foreign country, not just to visit, but to live at least for mm -hmm. a significant amount of time. Had, did you know anyone over here? Did you have friends or um, what? Yeah, no, no, no friends, no, right. no connections. It was so the, well, to provide context, the mm -hmm. first thing I did to, to be here was to do an internship in Yamaguchi Prefecture in okay. a, a city called Ube. I'm not sure if you're mm -hmm. familiar. I, I'm familiar with Iwakuni. I'm, I've been to, uh, sorry, uh, Yamaguchi. I've been to Iwakuni, but uh, I haven't been to Ube, no. So. Yeah, well, Iwakuni is, you know, close by, too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, no. Uh, so Ubeishi, it's, uh, well, I was to work at a glass plant to teach English to uh, the glass plant employees and to, you know, do some basic translation work and to help mm -hmm. with, um, you know, just office affairs, you know, just see what it was like to work in a Japanese office. And that was for three months. And, um, you know, because it was the countryside, obviously very few people speak English there. And uh, it was a very good opportunity for me to like, you know, uh, learn how to live on my own, how to cook, how right. to clean, how to do mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. 
So I'm not, I'm not going to say that, you know, obviously that was all done for me back like in America. I had some, you know, obviously I'm a 19 year old adult, you know, you right. know how to do some of that things. But when you're on your own for the first time, you literally have to do everything yourself. It really causes you to wise up and to, mm -hmm. you know, to mature. Yeah. And for that to happen, especially in like a country where, you know, it's not where I'm from originally, it's, you know, a brand new experience that really like helped me get a sense of independence. So, you know, rather than being afraid, rather than, you know, thinking that, you know, being intimidated, right, I viewed it as like a new challenge as a way to like, you know, to improve myself. Yeah, um, I had very similar experience. I, I actually came to Japan at 23, um, my, you know, first stepping foot into Japan, new, absolutely nobody. Um, it wasn't my first time to travel by myself, nor was it first time to travel abroad, but it was the first time I was moving somewhere abroad and, and living for, for long term. And, you know, I just remember stepping off uh, the plane at, you know, Narita Airport and, you know, getting on the on the train to to where I was going to be doing my training. And I'm just like, you know, a, a lot of people would kind of maybe get a little freaked out, like, oh, what am I? I don't know anybody. I don't know what to do. Um, I don't even speak the language. Um, but for me, it just felt like a, a sense of calm. Like, yeah, I, you know, it, this this is the decision I made. So I'm just going to do it, you know, so it, there was no there's no apprehension. There was no fear. There was nothing. It was just like, okay, this is reality. Yeah. Just, just head first into it, you know? Yeah. So, um, well, was... and also, also for me, uh, I'd been studying the language. Like I was so a Japanese major. And so mm -hmm. after the internship, I was supposed to do my junior year abroad, like in, in Kobe to, right. so, so to move, but you know, because I spoke the language, like to obviously my Japanese is much better now than it was uh, three years ago or four years ago, actually now mm. <laughs> you know, time flies, but mm. yeah. So, uh, you know, I was able to get through like basic conversations, you know, order stuff and do all that. But, you know, it's through whatever mistakes you make. That's how you learn. And, right. you know, anyone who's ever tried to learn like, you know, a second language knows that there's going to be a ton of like embarrassing mistakes that you do. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the great thing about, you know, most Japanese people is their understanding of that. They know that like, you know, their language is not really commonly spoken by most non-Japanese people. They know that it's a hard language and they're just happy that someone is making the effort to begin with. Yeah, I've, I've never been. Uh, and anytime I make a mistake, I've never been, you know, laughed at or criticized or anything. Um, uh, I've, I've had people assume, and probably rightfully so, that I, I don't speak the language or, or whatever, and, and they'll, but they'll, they'll try and hold my hand a little bit. And when they actually say, oh, no, he, you know, he, he can yeah. actually speak the language, they, they, there's a sense of like, ah, okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not dealing with the with a child here, you know, and, yeah. uh, and uh, even if you make a mistake and you catch it and you correct yourself, they just, it, it just like no reaction. They just, uh -huh, uh, and you know, they're just following your, your, um, your conversation, at least from my experience. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really reassuring that they, the people I've interacted with that, um, you know, there's no, there's no snickering, there's no backhanded compliment well yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, I, would I wouldn't say but... backhanded compliments but there are there are there is a bit of you know um fluff fluffing up you know uh, just but, in the but, beginning but, but once you have an established conversation going that flies out the window and they they know they're they're having a, a conversation you know? well, well especially the great thing about living in the countryside as i did when i was mm. starting out it's because almost no since almost nobody speaks english they have no choice but to talk to you in japanese exactly so mm. some, sometimes you know if you go to like major cities there's you know some very little degree of english well they'll try to like mumble through like a conversation try to try to make you feel comfortable to try to mm -hmm. speak english to you but if you're in the countryside where mostly middle-aged people and you know a lot of them don't even have any experience like leaving japan of like going to any other countries so you know basically it's like yeah well this person might not speak you know japanese fluently but it's basically the only way we have way we have to communicate with each other so exactly. we have to make the best use of what we have and that's the best environment to learn i think yeah so so you came to japan with with some knowledge of japanese so um in that sense what was your biggest um culture shock um if you had any mm. yeah uh, well, probably be so before coming here, I did have interaction with like some Japanese people just through my university because some people like studied abroad mm. and all that. But uh, I think it's just the way that, you know, Japanese people emote and how they, they express emotions, because a lot of people like in the West have this uh, mentality that, you know, East Asian people are like robots or like uh, mm. they don't mm. emote. But I don't find that at all. I think, you know. Japanese people certainly do emote, as do, you know, most people in most Asian countries. It's just mm -hmm. that I think how they emote and how they express their feelings is just a bit different than, you know, how you and me might, as, right. you know, as Americans. Oh, right, right. No, I mean, I, um, yeah, of course, there's pe pe people 
everywhere have emotions and, and express it. Um, I've seen, uh, I, I find, um, at least in my experience, that once there's a little bit of um, alcohol involved with interactions, all sorts of armor and you know falls off and it's it's just like having a, a chat with your friend back home you know it's uh, yeah. um laughter or anger or you know seeing fights in the streets I, I've, I've seen everything here yeah. you know pretty much and uh yeah it's just it's just um people are people it's just you know culturally when meeting someone new they, they might have different uh, ways of interacting with people yeah. you know and especially it, yeah a country like japan which is you know, even though they've been open to the rest of the world for, you know, going on 150 years now, um, they still have that island country mentality in a lot of ways, you know, so. You know, it's yeah. funny you mentioned that too. So as I mentioned, I was 19 years old when I came here and the drinking age is 20. So actually the first time I had any alcohol was actually coming to Japan. So, Interesting. Yeah, you could yeah. you could drink legally here before you could... Uh, before um, <laughs> and, legally in, in your own country you know and it's funny that that's funny too because when i went back uh, you know eventually after 15 months there was like a i think three month period where i was still 20 in america so <laughs> i could only like you know drink like at home or like you know like keep it on the dl and not like you know uh, do, go go to bars or anything like that right so, right yeah yeah um one thing i i noticed um just culturally here is uh, even though the, the legal drinking age is 20 they don't really check at all <laughs> yeah you know also like, when, I, when i when i turned to, uh, 20 years old i was like showing my edd to the person at like the 7-eleven and she was like what are you doing just take it yeah <laughs> just, just just press the button on the screen and get out of here sometimes yeah. they pressed it for you if i like, yeah. see like your hands are full they just either just press it for you <laughs> yeah 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 but um i mean i i don't know about may, maybe in the in the small town that you were at um, for a while but at least where i'm at here in some of the uh, more countryside towns you'll still see vending machines with alcohol yeah in it, and and wouldn't recommend ordering is probably stale but uh, same with yeah. the, the cigarettes stale, but, you know. and also there's a con there's a convenience just down the street anyways so exactly <laughs> but bother? yeah no no way to uh to stop just some junior high kid from putting money in and, and getting a beer you know so. yeah and, and when i went back to when i went so i'm from pittsburgh uh, pittsburgh pennsylvania when i went back to pittsburgh and i was trying to like get some you know when you go to like an alcohol store i, I don't know if it's just like state by state they like watch you like hawks basically mm -hmm. and i think that's just because you know they're they're just so concerned of underage people or people with fake ids uh right. you know taking alcohol and so i have a, a junior's driver's license which is like you know the same legal standards like standard driver's license. it's just like a portrait instead of landscape so mm -hmm. i showed the person you know this pennsylvania alcohol store my id and the guy's like this is a fake id i can't sell you this alcohol <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just this, that hit me yeah this is like such a way different way of doing things like than it, it is back in japan i, I will say I, I had an interesting experience using a, an id so i i had forgotten that um um americans you know, every, every anywhere it doesn't really matter on the state, but they, they do check your ID. Mm -hmm. You know, even my my mother, who's in her 60s, still gets ID. You know, so uh, it's just a, a common practice they do. But I had um, I'd come back to visit at one point, and for some reason I didn't have my American driver's license or my American ID on me. I just had my Japanese residence card, and I'm I ordered a, a margarita at a restaurant, and uh, they're like, we need to see some ID, and I'm like. I don't have like one with English on it. So I'm just like, uh, here. And so I, I showed them my, my residence card and they're just like, uh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> I said, oh, just, you know, I, I explained the situation and I uh, said, but you can see my, my date of birth on there. And they're like, I'll take your word for it. And they just gave it back. <laughs> and, you know, so, yeah. uh, it, that, that was, you know, interesting experience, but, um, yeah it's it's they they really that that's a big cultural difference yeah. too. Al Al just alcohol attitudes just, towards yeah. alcohol yeah. you know so yeah. like japan never went through a prohibition at least as far as i i know they, you know there was no prohibition of alcohol so. yeah well also that's the other thing too i've commented commented this on twitter multiple times but it's just like how both like you know in people in america both on the left and the right they kind of use japan to sort of like you know fit their own personal goals or their yep. political goals where so you have conservatives who say like Japan is a conservative country. And so it has all the ideals they want because, you know, the immigration is low. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's no guns here. There's no Second Amendment, nor will the right. letter will be, mm -hmm. you know, attitudes towards like alcohol and like, you know, sex. And, you know, there's porn shops like basically on every block, essentially. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, convenience stores openly yeah. sell, you know, 
pornography magazines. Uh, it's I, I remember at, walking. I level for children. You know? I remember walking in. I think this was like a couple months ago. Somebody had left one of those like you know porno mags like on the rack, but it was like open, so there was like a spread page wow. of like some yeah. Really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, we go well, okay. Someone gonna like you know clean this up or you know put this back or something you know because there could be kids watching. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I mean, so yeah, you, you have that, and so like I think the average like Christian Republican or whatever would be horrified if they learned about that. You know, right. so anything like abortion there's very little i think laws against that that too mm-hmm. yeah and um in in, in terms of, of guns now yeah it's very strict uh here but there are i i live in a prefecture that's um has a lot of uh, countryside so there are a lot of farmers and there's you know there's bears there's yeah. wild boars you know there's animals right so a lot of the farmers here have guns uh rifles yeah. you know licenses and I actually know a guy um, who lives in Nagano Prefecture who who has a farm that uh, uh, non Japanese too. I think he's maybe from France or uh, somewhere. Uh, but anyway, he um, he as a foreigner he was able to acquire a gun license and um, you know he he has it for hunting purposes. You know, but uh, it's it, it can be achieved here. It's just yeah, very, very strict hard. and you have to continuously you know, like you have to let the authorities know where you keep it and if it's locked, what the combination is or whatever, like you <laughs> pretty much have to give them all details and, and keep it, you know, um, constantly renewed or else you're yeah. in big trouble if you don't. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you see, that's, that's the thing that, you know, that would bother, you know, the constitutional conservatives or like libertarians with who want to have a laissez-faire attitude towards, towards firearms. But so then, you know, that's what, you know, people on the left, they say, well, you see, look, Japan has like almost no gun deaths because of how strict their laws are. Well, I mean, America was founded on armed violent revolution. And so you can't separate that mentality from, you know, the culture. I I, Mm -hmm. I tell people telling Americans to not use guns is like telling Japanese people to not eat sushi. It's just like a part. It's a a cultural pillar that's not going to go away. Yeah. And and that's the thing. It's like um, what works for one country doesn't work for the other. You know, it's it's culturally ingrained in, in Americans to to have arms, to defend themselves you know that's uh, even before the founding of the country you know people in the, in the frontiers you know the uh, um, manifest destiny sort of attitude you know um, so of course the you know homesteaders of course people Americans are culturally ingrained to to have that attitude so other countries don't understand uh, why are Americans so obsessed with guns yeah. well well it's just it's not that they're obsessed it's just part of their culture right so and even the people who want to restrict um gun rights in america are still not for banning them outright you know so um, some yeah. most you know but but then you get a country like japan japan doesn't need that yeah. you know i mean so to say well japan should have free guns well no it just they have a they have their own way of doing it and it works for them you yeah. know so i mean um there was a shooting death. That's the thing. Anytime you hear of a shooting death in Japan, it's national news, you know, because it's, it's so rare. But a couple of years ago, there was a shooting death here in my city. Um, it was between just two rival, you know, gang members. And but it, it happens that yeah. uh, that people flare tempers flare up and they'll pull a weapon out. But that's uh, that's not a, a common thing. But what is I, I wouldn't say it's common, but Japan isn't free from violent crime, though. Mm-hmm. There, there are some. I mean, it's, you're in Kyoto. There, yeah. Was it uh, last yeah. year? Was it yeah, last it was year that the, the the animation? No, uh, Twenty nine. No, summer 2019. Yeah. So a guy was just like okay. with just gasoline, like you know, killed like thirty people without right. using firing a single shot. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they they they're just more creative with uh, their destruction, you know. So yeah. But, well, I mean, you see, that's, like, one of the reasons why I like my life. I do feel safer, like, living in Japan mm-hmm. than I do, like, in America. But, I mean, you still have to exercise common sense no matter no matter what you do. I mean, right. you know, I mean, a lot of uh, women complain about, you know, stalking or, like, you know, uh, sexual assault or whatever. And I'm sure that stuff happens here, too. That's why we have, you know, women-only cars, you mm-hmm. know. There's you know, the Chikan incidents, though those are all very infamous too. So it's not like Japan doesn't have its own its own societal problems when it comes to that sort of thing. Right, right. It's just um, it's it's just unique to 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 them, you know. Um, it, it it is strange, or I wouldn't say strange, but you're right. There are women only train cars in in cities, you know, like Tokyo and Osaka, and it's just yeah. um, I 
I remember I made the mistake once of I was rushing to catch a train and I just jumped on and without realizing that I got on the uh, woman only <laughs> and I'm sitting there I'm like oh, I made it and I look around I'm like okay there's this car is fairly empty and there's women with baby strollers and stuff and I look around and there's like pink signs on the wall I go oh I'm probably in the wrong car and sure enough I was and I just got up and walked over out into a um, into the next car and but no one no one said anything though I guess because oh he just he he's he's not Japanese maybe he doesn't know but it, you know it is written clearly in English on there you know so um uh I just made a mistake honestly and and just got up and walked to the next car and it was fine but yeah, yeah I mean there there are things like that it put in place to prevent these crimes but you know out of all the uh my female friends that I have here like not one of them has not had an incident where they where something has happened to them where they've been followed or you know so it it is very common still well, that, it's also that. it's also so the other thing that was a big culture shock was just the attitude towards cheating here too there's a very yeah. like <laughs> fine line between like you know what's acceptable for like you know so there's like some people who are under the impression that it's more acceptable to like you know sleep with someone that's not your spouse or partner than it is to like go on a romantic date with them <laughs> right <laughs> because, yeah they're, they're more the, the emotional cheating is is worse than you know the physical cheating which yeah yeah that's a it's a bit weird to separate you know I've, so. I've even had people who like say yeah well you know it's okay if you like sleep with someone else if it's to like practice or it's to like you know you do, just don't tell me about it or whatever and it's like why like you would never hear that from most people like back mm. in the states i think yeah yeah i mean there, there's a lot of um failed marriages here that they just stayed yeah. together because culturally still d divorce is still considered a bit taboo um here it, it's becoming more acceptable accepted but uh it is still uh, a taboo amongst many Japanese. So yeah. um, no, I'm I'm very lucky that I've uh, found a partner that I'm like you know finally happy with that you know yeah. we're on, on the same page. But the thing is, it's like I've seen not not just with like other foreigners, with other like Japanese people too. Mm -hmm. Everybody is in such a hurry to get married, especially like after university and you know in the first beginning years of like you know of working. And because you're in such a hurry to get married, you end up marrying the wrong person or who you don't share the same values with. And right. You know, there's a lot of people in America who make the same mistake where they think, well, if we just have kids, it'll so solve everything. That'll oh, yeah, then that always helps, you know. So. Yeah, but no, that can just lead to even worse problems. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I, I I think that's the other thing, maybe uh, an aspect of Japanese society that I'm glad that I didn't have to like go through being raised. It's just the whole like procedures of everything where mm. there's a set time to, you know, go to university. There's a set time to like look for a job. There's a set time to get married. And right. I think that for, you know, for some people, that's fine. I guess, you know, it's a sense of security. But for other people who you know, want to be more free to choose what they want to do. I think that's a very constricting, constricting form. And that's also, I think, why there's, I, I've, you know, met Japanese people who study abroad. They want to live in America or Canada or Europe because they feel like there's those restrictions don't exist on them. They feel more free to choose. Right. Yeah. So it, it's kind of grass is always greener sort of thing, you know, because um, I still to this day, you know, I, I've been in Japan now going on, this will be my um, 13th year. Yeah. And, um, I still have people say uh, who've who like Japan who've never come here who who are, are jealous or, or, or not jealous but they're just they, they're envious you know they're like ah oh, that that must, I'm that's so cool and and for me it's just normal now you know it's yeah. just <laughs> but um but so I, I just tell them I'm like well, Japan's just a, a another country yeah I mean it's yeah. it's yeah it's it has its cool aspects of it and I like it here or else I wouldn't be here after so long but um you know this sort of romanticizing of, of other places outside of your own country is um I, i'm i wouldn't say it's wrong it's just um it's unrealistic think, yeah so yeah, i think people should just take a more realistic approach to everything don't, you know so don't romanticize other places um in particular and, and in fact don't don't take the opposite approach to your own country too, because um, I, I've noticed since I've left America that, um, you know, I, I, when I go back to visit every once in a while, it, it's nice, but uh, there's certain aspects that I do miss yeah. about it, you know, and, and uh, it, it's kind of um, a nostalgic uh, feeling to, to reminisce about certain things that I just can't 
experience here. So well, I mean, yeah. to, to, to speak to your point on that. So I, I really like customer service in Japan. Obviously, mm -hmm. I think it's some of the best in the world, you know, sometimes to the extent, you know, to the detriment of the employees who have to like, you know, achieve that high standard. But mm -hmm. one thing I do miss is just you know, having a conversation with like, you know, with staff, like at a restaurant, or exactly, like business. Right. or, mm -hmm. you know, when you're sitting at the bus stop, you just like strike up a conversation with other people. Now, there's people that don't like that they think that it's all like superficial, or that, like, you know, it doesn't mean anything. And, you know, to an extent, it doesn't mean anything. But it does kind of like, you know, have like a more it's nice to have that friendly atmosphere i think you know right. rather than just business uh you to some extent you can find that here it's more in in terms of i would say like bars or you know yeah. izakayas you know like um especially in smaller ones where uh, i mean there's a there's an izakaya I, I frequent in my city that you know I've, I've met the owner when i first moved here and we've just been you know friends since then you know so <laughs> it's a uh, you know you, you become familiar with people but you're right. That just that that kind of casual friendliness um, it, it, that exists. For example, you know, I went back to America once, and uh, I was getting um, gasoline at the at the station, and just walk in, and you know, the the clerk just says, "Hey, how are you doing? I'm fine. How's your day?" And they just go on about, "Well, you know, this morning my dog threw up," and I'm just <laughs> it, like, "It's like I don't really care," but at the same time, it's like, "Oh, that's." interesting you know like uh they'll, they'll just share yeah. that information with you and no you don't have that here it's just it's in in a sense yeah they do the customer cares they do take care of the customers but it's still it's, it's very there's no personal aspect to it it's just very um yeah. though, you know, the, the other side of that though, way, yeah. though, the other side of that though is especially now i think americans are more po politically polarized more than ever and because mm -hmm. of all the divisions and stuff that's a very you know unique american phenomenon i know that like you know the uk they have brexit and they have like you know other contentious issues but i think especially because of americans of how known they are for you know stating their opinions openly and for holding their you know opinions like their convictions so strongly that's why you have so much you know arguing and so much division related to that well like in japan yeah politics are discussed here especially if you go to like a bar especially with older people and all that but the difference is they don't treat politics like a religion basically they don't right. treat it like you know it's the mm. entire reason for living that i think a lot of americans especially unfortunately people my age tend to do yeah um yeah i mean people my generation too take take things um very serious in terms of um you know politics um actually more i've seen from for me growing up is um especially where i'm from i'm I'm from a southern state so religion was very important but yeah. i've noticed that religion has now been overtaken in importance by politics yeah. people yeah. take their po political beliefs more serious than their religious beliefs now and it's um that's a very strange thing for me to see because i when i left it was still more the religion is more important than yeah. the politics they were close but i that since i've been here they've they've sort of um uh it's sort of over not overlapped uh, you know politics has taken more serious um role in in american society and it's um it's bizarre to see the almost cult-like following that people from any political persuasion yeah. will have you know yeah. these days and I, and, and I and i say that too as like an atheist as somebody who mm -hmm. you know grew up reading christopher hitchens and richard mm -hmm. docks and stuff so those people they did a you know a very like thorough job of like dismantling religion so to speak and that appealed to a lot of people but what they didn't do was provide like you know a meaning for a lot of people to live and that's why jordan peterson and like you know those philosophers why they're so popular now with people because they're filling that god-shaped hole yep. as a uh, writer douglas murray describes you know mm -hmm. and you know, for some people, you know, Jordan Peterson, that's good. You know, that's a positive way of, you know, bettering yourself, cleaning your room and, you know, having yeah. a, re <laughs> a reason to like, you know, to get up in the morning. But, you know, for a lot of other people, you know, all the, all the woke stuff or, you know, the MAGA stuff, you know, the two sides of the stream, that is their reason for waking up in the morning. <laughs> and I just don't think that's a very healthy or like long-term way to live. Well, I mean, we've seen how it kind of culminated in what happened just the other day, yeah. and, you know, and um, it's... I wouldn't say I predicted that no one, no one could have mm -hmm. seen what would actually happen, but you, it's been going on for years, this sort of division and, and try and painting the other side as the bad guy. And eventually you on both sides too. If you, if you paint the other side as evil enough, things are going to come to a head. And yeah. we saw that happen last year um, with people, people's response to lockdowns to the uh, the race riots uh and now to um you know the uh the the storming of um 
of the Capitol building, you know, like these things are the consequence of all the vitriol and rhetoric that you've heard from for years now, years, if not um, decades, you know, because I'm, I'm old enough to remember actually watching the Waco siege on TV live. I was, I was young. I was um, eight, I believe, but I remember my dad having the news on and just watching and my hometown is about an hour's drive from Waco. So it was real. Yeah. And I, and I saw that. And I remember when Oklahoma city happened and, you know, like these, these events were all very big major events and it was the political rhetoric was going on then, you know, you had your Rush Limbaugh's, you had, you know, <laughs> people saying the Clintons were evil and, and were, um, were, were murdering people down in Arkansas and stuff <laughs> like all that talk was happened was around back in the nineties, you know? So it, it's not a new phenomenon that um, this sort of, it's just probably, I, I, I would say social media has exacerbated it yes. a lot, you know? So, and, and that's, what's the difference between now and, 30 years ago you know yeah and so i've seen like you know the japanese i watch uh, tv all the time too it's always in the background because it's good to you know improve my japanese and all right. that but it's also mm-hmm. interesting to see how you know japanese newscasters how they view like you know american politics because they have all these experts and stuff they hire to talk about what's going on and i'm just seeing the horrified expressions on these like you know hosts their face they're seeing what's going on in the capitol building they're seeing what's happening with like you know the race riots and all that mm-hmm. And I think to myself, this just reflects really poorly upon our society for the rest of the world. And don't get me wrong. There's so many Japanese that love America. A lot of them mm-hmm. want to come to America, at least to visit. They, they they have a good impression. But when you see, you know, stuff like this, when you see only the extremes, it, like it doesn't reflect well, like on us at all. And I think especially this year, as we're getting another administration, both sides are going to really have to ask themselves, what kind of society do we want to live in? And how can we live in mm-hmm. like, you know, society when we have like these opposing views? Yeah. Yeah. And um, you're right, though, like, you know, I have me being an American where I live, um, especially with in in my my job and and my social circle, I'm one of the few Americans there. So it's always I'm always asked, why is this happening or what, what what's going on? And, and, you know, I do keep up with it. But part of me is just like I, I'm I'm the de facto ambassador to to represent my country and i'm just like to be honest um you know i could go i could go on for hours about um i i don't i don't really take a side you know they they, they try to say well do you like trump or biden i'm like i'm not getting into that because yeah, um <laughs> you know um i have my own nuanced way of thinking but um i do i do try to give it an objective um um commentary on it if they'll listen and um they're, they're just curious, you know, especially yeah. Japanese. They're just curious about something because for them, it's it's very, if they've been to America, they kind of understand American mentality a bit and um, it's easier to, to have a conversation. But for some that have never traveled abroad, especially to America, they're, they're just genuinely curious about how can this happen? My image of America is this, but this is happening. And, and they say, well, mm-hmm buckle up because uh if you, if you want a good history lesson i can give it to you so uh, you know i'm you know. writing a paper now for a uh, final paper for my graduate course about the japanese red army if you're familiar with them. oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah so and that's an age like in the late 60s early 70s where you know far left you know splinter cell groups are like uh you know committing violent acts like daily in the streets to try to like you know bring about their revolution and mm-hmm. the japanese public looked at what they were doing and they thoroughly rejected that they condemned these people for what they did and uh you know the surviving members of these like you know political groups that cause violence they're either dead or in jail or basically like in obscure corners of of japan where they're living in disgrace and you know that's an example of i think a society that has basically collectively said no we don't want this we know that we have problems we know that there's things to to address but this isn't the way of addressing them right yeah um especially you know that domestic terrorism you know a lot of people don't realize that that happened in in japan and um the only recent um similar situation was with the 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 ohm cult you know the yeah. shindiko um that happened in in the mid 90s and uh, but that that was more religious based and not um political based but you're right um there's the society as a whole rejected that here and um that's why even the communist party in japan is it's not communist it's just more <laughs> i would say like a bernie sanders sort of social 
socialist or you know, democratic socialist i yeah. would say that's that's how kind of they yeah. operate yeah and the thing is it's like you know they had they broke they actually like broke recently with china because now they're accusing mm -hmm. the chinese communist party of not being communist enough though and if you look at this it's just very sad you know a lot of these people like so i don't think that viewpoint is uh, you know mainstream at all in japan mm -hmm. it had the jcp has like some i think degree of influence on local politics to some degree but local yes yeah mm -hmm. yes but overall no i don't really think so and i think you know it I think it's also just because of the, you know, the, this, the, the people who are old enough to remember these, like, you know, the red armies, like violent tactics, they've got the bad taste in their mouth. They don't want mm -hmm. to go down that route again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it, po politics in, in Japan is quite interesting. I, I remember uh, when uh, it, this happens actually a, a lot throughout the year, but this, this happened particularly on the first year of Reiwa when the, when it changed over to Reiwa there, I saw an abundance of the black, trucks with the uh with the old imperial flag flying around on that day you know and um you know they people usually people here just usually ignore them yeah you know no one gives them any attention but it's um these these older older gentlemen wearing black clothes dark sunglasses driving black vans with some you know some propaganda going around talking about the the glory days of the empire <laughs> you know and <laughs> Um, the first time you see that, you're you're kind of taken aback, but it's it's so common now that um, yeah. it's not really um, it's just an annoyance because they're very loud. So, but but also uh, you know to your point earlier about how social media has amplified everything. I think there's mm -hmm. a new generation of uh, expats who like live in uh, Japan, but they're very you know more liberal or left leaning minded, and so they report about these things, but the way that they try to like portray Japan is saying, oh, this is what all of Japan is like. This has like such a huge influence, like fascism is taking over Japan. You know, Japan is like a inherently racist fascist country. And I just don't think that kind of rhetoric is, it's first off, it's not accurate. I don't think it's yeah, true. It's not accurate. But, yeah. but it's also, it, it's really not giving the Japanese people enough credit for the society they've created. You know, they've created a, a generally safe society. It's one of the few democracies like in East Asia that, you know, of course things aren't perfect as most countries aren't, but mm -hmm. you know, They've come a long way since, like you know, the the war time. So, you know, and you would think they would in like seven decades. I I have to give Japan a lot of credit because you you they've reinvented themselves several times in the last one hundred and fifty years. You know, yes. so when they when they were you know opened up, they they basically went from a medieval society to an industrial society in a matter of twenty years. You know, and then they amplified that became you know the the empire and then they had to start all over again after world war ii and the, the occupation and they did it they 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 reinvented their entire um government and and with the help with you know the u.s as well uh, had some influence in that but their economy definitely they they were re able to revitalize that up until the 80s and um i think you know, it's been economically, it's been quite stagnant in the past 30 years. But, you know, I, I, I got it. I wouldn't put it past people here to, you know, reinvent themselves yet again, you know, still, in, in, still in that way, you still know, number three too. still number yeah. three economy in the world. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. used used to be number two, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's still number three. So, <laughs> Yeah, but it's just like, I don't understand the mentality of people who like voluntarily move here and then they just complain. I mean, mm. I know that Japan has its like problems and it's not perfect as no country is, but mm. like you chose to move here. And especially exactly. as, mm. you know, especially this comes from mostly from like Americans or like Canadians or like Westerners. We're among some of the most like privileged foreigners who are able to move here. The majority of foreigners who come here, they're not American, they're not Canadian, they're from like the Philippines or from China or, mm. you know, from Southeast Vietnam, Asian countries. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. Vietnam. And mm -hmm. these are people that have to like live in collective housing or they have to like clean floors or clean toilets for a living you know just to pay you know the rent on time right so i mean and you don't really hear them complaining about it because you know they come from like a, con a country where you know whatever they make here that's enough money to like send back to their family back over there or to have like a stepping stone for a better life and you know uh, like i said there's legitimate complaints you can have about japan and we should have we should have those conversations but I just don't see, you know, when there's so much good here, when there's so much to like, you know, so many opportunities, why would you waste your time complaining? Just take advantage of what you have. Yeah, you, uh, that's, it's um, refreshing to hear that from, from someone of a younger generation. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not an old man, but you know, you're right. It's, it's just, um, it, it's, I always kind of laugh 
a little bit when I hear of anyone from a first world country moving to another first world country and complaining about something that's different than their own first world country, you know, like, do you not realize, you know, how good you actually have it, you know, like, just because, uh, granted, yeah, there are some issues here, I, like, I, I would, it would be nice if uh, Japan took um, mental health a little bit more more serious than it than it does i mean and to their credit there are um doctors here that do um there are psychologists here that that do and especially ones that have studied in western countries that have studied western psychology and things so um they do exist there are good great counselors but as a whole japan is um still a little bit behind in in recognizing that in terms of um day-to-day -day life, you know, like employers are, are less sympathetic in terms of just gambaru and gaman, gaman and gambaru, you know, just get through it and, and cope with it by drinking after work or something, you know. <laughs> so there are some some things that can be improved upon, but, um, you know, where where else you, you're not, you you would be worse off if you, if you move even somewhere else that you might even think is, um, you know, provides better you know every every place is going to have its its yeah. upsides and downsides so. it's really funny so it's people who complain about everything about that's wrong with america or canada or whatever country then mm -hmm. they move here thinking it's going to be much better they complain about everything that, that you know they don't like here yeah. then they move back to whatever whatever country they came from and then they only just remember the good parts you know that came here and they go back to complaining about their home country and i yeah. think that's just a more of a mentality of you'll never be happy no matter where you live exactly it, it's a, it's a mentality of um you know it's just it's just people who view the world, how they're, how they view the world, no matter what, like you're either going to complain all the time or, or you're going to, um, I wouldn't say be too optimistic about things, but you know, a little bit of realism is great, you know, because yeah. it keeps your, keeps unfettered optimism is not good either, you know, um, but uh, it keeps, keeps you in check. But, you know, um, I think that, like I say, I, I laugh at it a little bit, but I think it's almost a little bit sad too, to see it's a, one particular group of people who moved to Japan who envision it as this giant uh, anime, you know, yeah. and they come here and their dreams are shattered and then they become some of the biggest critics of yeah. Japan, you know, and um, it's like, well, you know, look at it realistically, do your research other than anime. And it's not just them, but you know, yeah. they, they do exist. And then, um, you know, just research a, just a little bit now and think of any issues that you have back home, research how Japan, how, how that is dealt with in Japan first before you move. Because if you move there and you're not willing to accept how Japan handles things like mental health or, or, or something like that, then maybe it's not a good idea if you come here, you know? Yeah. Um, you I know, think, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just think that uh, in my case, I've been very lucky because my, you know, family, there are immigrants. I'm a, I'm a child of immigrants, especially mm -hmm. on my dad's side where he left China to move to America, you know, typical American dream story, but he worked hard to, you know, become a successful violinist in the Pittsburgh Symphony. And, you know, thinking about his experience of moving from such like a desolate, poor country to one of like the richest countries in the world where he worked hard to get to where he was. I mean, that inspires mm -hmm. me to do the same. And right, I, yeah. I have it much easier. I'm moving from, like you said, a first world country to another first world country. I'm right. not moving from like a third world country to, you know, to, to a first world country. Now, you said your father went through the cultural revolution in, in china right yes right. he he escaped that correct yeah. well he so he escaped in the sense like he he left at the first opportunity that the the, 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 the doors were open so he was okay. born in 1954 and the cultural revolution was from 66 to 76 so mm. he was old enough to be of conscious age to like live through all 10 years and mm -hmm. because he practiced so hard at the violin in china he was able to get a music scholarship that you know from european musicians to study in switzerland and then that eventually went to america and canada okay. In so, interest, yeah. But I mean, to give you a perspective, he was on national TV with I think four other Chinese musicians out of all of like this, you know, the top schools and everything. He was one of five people to leave China to go to have this music scholarship. Wow, that's 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 really good. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, now, to those not really familiar with what the Cultural Revolution was, um, briefly, like what 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 exactly did China do? during that time period and um, why is it significant that your your father was able to 
-hmm. escape, so to speak, and, and make a better life for himself. Mm -hmm. Well, first, I should preface that I'm not a China expert, you know, despite okay. my female background, mm -hmm. I'm a North Korea, more Japan, like that's more of my field. But in mm -hmm. terms of the Cultural Revolution, it was essentially the Chinese Communist Party's attempt under Mao Zedong to um, change the societal fabric of uh, China. You know, mm -hmm. this was after the Great Leap Forward and the agricultural plants had failed, like millions of people were, you know, killed or starved to death. You know, the numbers are debated by many scholars, but something but a lot of people died <laughs> yeah, a lot of people like yeah. starved to death or were purged or whatever and so following that the so they wanted to have more control over the society of how discourse was shaped how uh you know the arts uh you know economy all of that and so uh you know my grandfather had to shut down his uh, privately owned uh, violin teaching business because you know private business is not allowed under, under the uh you know communist party uh, education was reformed where basically all the stuff that like you were taught like in school was just to praise the government mm. very similar to North Korea uh, you know as soon as you graduated you'd probably be sent to the fields to work on collective farms uh, they would get the best you know scientists and stuff like that to, for better jobs obviously but most people who like you know shouldn't have gone to the countryside because that's just not what they're suited to do for they were right. but my uh, dad you know in the very beginning of course he, he um, didn't know what he wanted to do he didn't like the violin at all or music but um, because my grandfather really instilled within him and, you know, his other siblings, my aunts and uncles to, you know, uh, study hard and to do well, he was able to have a much better life for himself than most people around him. He was able to get a full-time job at the Peking Opera. So he had food every month, they had yeah. lodging and all that. And that's much more than, uh, you know, most Chinese had. And so they're from Shenyang too, which is in uh, Manchuria, Northeast China. So, right. um, you know, everybody is poor in those days, obviously. But I mean, if you live in a city like that, you have a marginally better living than I think most people around you. Yeah, I, I was actually going to bring that up. Like, um, did was there's a a lot of people don't realize that, you know, China is very ethnically diverse. Um, there are a lot of different uh, ethnicities there. And um, was, you know, the, the majority of people are the Han Chinese. But I mean, there's, you know, Manchurians and, and people like that. So um, a lot a lot of it, as we can kind of see now with what they're doing with the Uyghurs, you know, they, you know, want to stamp out, in a sense, you know, certain cultural cultures within their borders um, to, to be more uniform with, with what they feel yeah. is the right way, you know, so. Yeah, no, and also uh, my Chinese family, so if they see what's happening now under uh, Xi Jinping, they're all horrified, obviously, with what's going yeah. on, because, mm. you know, um, you know, I still have some family members who are still still there, but most of them, uh, you know, moved to either Canada or to the U.S. And uh, yeah, I would even have a cousin in Hong Kong. So imagine that situation, oh, <laughs> situation man. that's going down. Yeah, but, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just sad to think that there's people who literally they swam from China to Hong Kong during the Cultural Revolution, swam like through everything, swam to get there. And now they're seeing the same evil that they escaped taking over Hong Kong. Yeah. Can you imagine growing up in Hong Kong your whole life and then now that's... Yeah. Well, if, you, if you grew up in Hong Kong and you're mm. a certain age, you've probably seen a lot of different influences. You saw the end of the British occupation yeah. and then, mm -hmm. you know, seeing Hong Kong to rebuild itself. And then you see it being taken over by the Communist Party. Yeah. 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 It's um, it, it it's it that that saddened me. Uh, the Hong Kong thing um, in 2019 mm -hmm. uh, was 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 quite a sad story to see. And yeah. um, then it seemed like that was getting a lot of news coverage. And then coronavirus sort of stamped that out yeah. and um, sadly China was able to use the advantage of coronavirus restrictions to to sort of you know clamp down any last dissent that Hong Kong had you know it was really so uh, last year I watched uh, Ken Burns' documentary on the Vietnam War it's a very mm. beautiful film yep. it's like 19 hour 19 hours long I think and yeah. what reminded me was so there's the you know famous scene of the South Vietnamese refugees. They're escaping Vietnam when they know their country is about to collapse. They know that if they like stay behind, they're going to be taken by the communist authorities or put into re-education camps. And that kind of reminds me. I think one day, you know, not to the same scale, and obviously because Hong Kong is in a much better position economically than South Vietnam was in those days. But you're going to see a lot of like a huge mass exodus of people. And I think. You know, it was supposed to be, I think, until 2047 or 2046 that the, you know, the 50 year agreement was supposed to end that, you mm. know, it'd be a two, two, it's like a two countries, one system. But right. um, don't be surprised if the CCP decides to, like, you know, kickstart that early or if they try to, like, break that agreement. And when that happens, you're going to see a mass exodus of people. Yeah. Um, I can already see that happening now. And um, I, I see a lot of that. I see a lot of um, 
diaspora going on with many countries in 2021, um, not just China, but mm. uh, that that's a that's a whole other topic. I think. Yeah. So I mean, mm. I think uh, so. The UK and the US they pledged to like take in so many Hong Kong refugees, but mm. what's going to happen is that so Hong Kong is a very highly educated society. A lot of them speak English. You know there are people that I think any country would welcome, you know, to improve their society. But what's going to happen is all the best people are going to leave Hong Kong and whoever's left, is just going to become another part of communist China. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, have you, have you been to Hong Kong at all? Have you visited? I've never been, I've never stepped foot in any part of China in my entire life, which Um, is, you know, a regret of mine, but you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Hong Kong was one of the cities I was always keen on visiting someday and now it just doesn't seem like that's ever in the cards, you know, yeah. so. Well, unfortunately, we live like in a time where I don't think it's going to be viable to go anywhere for, you know, the foreseeable future. Yeah, that and that's really unfortunate. No, so that's what I want to um, also kind of um, ask you about. Now, you've, a lot of people are unfamiliar with um, how Japan has been handling the coronavirus situation. Now, you've, you had to go back to America for, for a time recently. Yes. And so how was your experience, not only leaving Japan in this time, going back to America during this time, and then coming back to Japan, mm-hmm. um, re-entering Japan as a non-citizen. Like, uh, can, yeah. can you can you kind of give a breakdown sure. about that whole experience? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, I had to go back to America for personal family reasons mm-hmm. uh, in uh, the end of September. So uh, to do that, you have to first request permission from the Japanese government to leave. You, there's an email address. I think it's on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, website. You just email them. You just give them your details, you know, what you're, why you're leaving and all that. And, you know, 99% chance, as long as you fill out the form, right, they'll give you the permission. It says, okay, well, we've given you this permission to, like, come back on this day, print out this email, and just show it to the people at the airport when you leave and when you come back. So that's step one. You uh, just go back to, you know, your home country. And when you land, it's going to be, you know, based off just how your country handles the coronavirus. But um, the U.S., I didn't have any kind of, like, you know, screening or any kind of, like, health check. It was really just because I'm a citizen anyway, so they're not mm-hmm. going to turn me, turn me down. So I was able to go back to the US. I had to fly through actually Europe though. So, and the reason for that is, is when you come back to Japan, you can't use public transportation Mm -hmm. for uh, 14 days. So that means like, let's say as you're me, you live in Kyoto or Osaka, you can't live, you can't go to like Tokyo and then take the Shinkansen or even another plane back to where you are. You have to arrange private transportation or quarantine at a hotel for 14 days. So I had to book a very expensive ticket that basically went from Kix to uh, France and then from France to Atlanta, Georgia, and then from Atlanta, Georgia to Pittsburgh. So wow. very long, very tedious flight. And then coming back, it's uh, I think it was Atlanta, and then it was the, the Netherlands, and then it was the Kix. So, so it, was, it wasn't the, the traditional just over the Pacific or, or anything, no. Um, no direct flights or anything. Yeah, I was, I was flying for over 30 hours straight. That's, that's how long the transit mm-hmm. was. The, um, the wait time in just the Charles de Gaulle airport alone was, I, I arrived there at like four in the morning and the flight didn't leave till like, I think 11. So it's, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so but, and then airports are fairly empty, right? Yeah. Well, days, they yeah. were empty in the beginning, but actually when I was there at the Charles de Gaulle airport, there were actually quite a few people like towards, okay. towards the mid towards mm-hmm. midday. But yeah, that's, that's the biggest point I have to like emphasize that if you need to leave Japan and come back for whatever reason, have a plan when you come back here. So I was also very lucky because I had a friend who could uh, drive me from uh, kicks to my house mm-hmm. in uh, Kyoto. And, you know, that's obviously much more doable than having than driving from all the way from Narita airport to, you know, Kyoto, which is like a, I think an eight hour drive or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. But then, uh, so back in America, uh, well, I mean, just the first thing that hit me when I went to America was um, my life in Japan hasn't really changed that much compared to a year ago in terms of like, you know, walking around and in terms of like business and stuff and being open. But in America, the atmosphere is completely different. It is very yeah. much like a thing that's consciously on everybody's mind. There's so many yeah. uh, places that are still closed. And uh, <laughs> what stood out to me was so I was asking my brother, hey, how about we go see a movie? You know, now I'm back in town. And my brother was looking at me like, are you crazy? We can't go there. <laughs> when the movie, yeah, theaters, the movie theaters here are still open <laughs> that's yeah that's that's nuts because i mean japan can't legally lock down it you know according to their constitution there are, there are no hard lockdowns here they can just suggest people stay home which i mean my city just the other day actually before tokyo and um the surrounding prefectures um my city utsunomiya was um had a sudden spike in, in cases. And so we actually declared a state of emergency before Tokyo did. Mm-hmm. And, but all that amounted to was the restaurants close at, and restaurants and bars close at eight o'clock. Yeah. And they say, uh, if you don't have to go out, don't go out. 
but it, this is very different than last spring, which um, my my company that um, we um, we we closed down for about a month, but we still operated because we we were able to shift online, uh, so we were able to do remote work for at least a month. But um, so we were lucky in that regard. But my gym was closed; they discounted me. Uh, like last spring was much more strict here than now, but the cases were not nearly as high as they are now. So yeah. um, it, it's interesting how um, they're handling it, which I'm grateful that we're still able to have a sense of freedom, uh, mobile, you know, mobility. We can, we can go places, you know, there's obviously the uh, masks, everyone wears masks. Most people wear masks here. Um, the, the social distancing, I, I would say that's just, um, window dressing to, though to be honest because yeah. not very many people follow that here but up until recently the the um, the severity of the the situation here wasn't really apparent um, some people say you know the government's hiding the true numbers um, but we don't know it's just based on the number of tests that they're doing right so but um, it is interesting to see that um, for all the faults that Japan does have they've been able to allow the residents and citizens here to move around freely. And uh, it's it's such an alien concept because I haven't been back since before this situation happened. So I can't imagine going back home and, and not being able to freely move about how I wish, mm -hmm. you know. And um, well, also uh, the thing is too, so last year for family emergencies, I had to go back mm -hmm. twice actually. So I went back in uh, March when, mm -hmm. which was right before everything like bad was happening. That was right before the, Japan closed its borders. So. I was able to come back literally within, I think, a week before uh, Japan said, "Okay, now if you leave Japan, you can't come back." And that wow. was a, yeah. and that was a, the thing is. So that's the other thing too that I think there was a gaff on, and I think it was because the government was just panicking. Where if you left, even as like a resident or even as a permanent resident, there was a time for I think a few months where you couldn't come back in after a certain point. And it's yeah, only, I mean, hmm. yeah, and it's only relatively recently that they were able to revise. That. I was saying, okay, yeah, foreign um, residents and permanent uh, permanent residents can come back in, and that's also the other. Part that i would uh, talk about is the you have to have a pcr test negative within 72 hours of coming back and before that was only for foreigners but now i think as of just a few days ago japanese citizens need that too yeah i have a, a a friend japanese friend who they live he and his family live in ohio and they they came back for new year's and they're still i think maybe they're st still in quarantine um so you know he's having to obviously work remotely um because uh, you know business is going back in in America and Japan, but he and his family have been you know stuck at a hotel near Narita Airport you know <laughs> for you know two weeks now, and um, they're they, you know his kids they are enjoying being back in Japan, and getting all the sweets and stuff, but um, they'll be here for a short time, and then they're you know it's back to doing the same thing again back you know in in America. So yeah, um, and uh, well. I'm glad that the government came around to like, you know, letting people in who are actually here, but now, you know, they're closing new visa applications for the time being. And I think that's, yeah. the, that's a wise choice. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense right now, especially with new strains going on. Like um, I, I really don't have an, any objection to, um, I mean, I mean, Japan is makes its own rules. So yeah. that's it. They're, they don't seem to be really discriminatory. Um, it's understandable what they're what they're doing in in terms of that and how they're handling it domestically in terms of um people's freedoms i i have no issue with you know yeah, so they gave us the same stimulus checks as uh, you know every other citizen that's here too right and so as much as people complain i'd be like hey <laughs> we got we got that we got that corona money just as much as anyone else did so uh, yeah and, and i mean was, also it was very easy to get for me <laughs> so not, not, easy me know? too but not only just that they helped foreigners who like were coming to the end of their visa to help them extend it yep. to the residency mm -hmm. to like you know making things easier for them so when people say that like japan is like a racist country or it's like a country that doesn't care about its foreigners i just I, the evidence doesn't really support that hmm. yeah and in terms of immigration and visas you're right um i've as long as you tick all the right boxes and mm. fill out the paperwork properly, you're you're pretty much good to go. You know, I, I actually applied for permanent residency last uh, last year. I'm I'm still waiting on that. It's a six to nine month wait yeah. time. So um, we'll see. Um, have you ever and, thought of, have you ever, have you thought of citizenship at all? No. Um, 
if if Japan allowed dual citizenship, I would. I, I don't quite want to. I want to have the option mm -hmm. of of keeping my American passport. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, do you have a different? I, I've 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 heard rumblings around that you you might have a different attitude towards that. Am, am I right or no? Sure. Well, I mean, the way that I see it is, so I'm a dual citizen of like America and Canada, and mm -hmm. you know that's out of convenience. It's just because my mother's Canadian, so I was able to get the pa the passport. And to me, I think the difference between citizenship and you know permanent residency. Permanent residency is still technically the privilege of living in a country because the government is allowing you to stay. Right. Citizenship is the right. It's the right that you know it's an unalienable right that you have the right to be here. And so. The way that I view it is if you're going to be here for, you know, decades and you have a family and you're not going to leave. Well, yeah, I think it makes sense to naturalize. But um, you're, you're not married, are you? And you don't no, have kids? No. Yeah. So no. if for somebody in your position where you're still single, you still have like a plenty of opportunities to go anywhere. I think it makes sense to still be a permanent resident. But uh, the reason why most people naturalize is for their family. It's to yeah. avoid unfortunate situations like last year where the government wouldn't let in permanent residents. Now, I think that they should let in permanent residents because for all intents and purposes, they're still doing the same things as citizens, paying taxes, right. you know, contributing to society and all that. But, you know, it makes sense that a country is going to want to put its citizens before anybody else. And that includes, yeah. and that's not just Japan, that's pretty much every any, country any in the country. world. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, well, no, I've only I, been, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just one thing. So yeah, I've been here for three years and I'm a graduate student now. And my goal is to become an academic here to like, you know, uh, work at a Japanese university to write books to, you know, do all that sorts of th all those things. But I do see myself like if I'm here, going to be here for the rest of my life, you know, which I can't know for sure, obviously, because it's still technically the beginning for me. But let's say that it does become that way, I would consider citizenship at that point. Right, right. And, th and that does make sense. And, you know, I don't fault people for, for choosing that. Um, there are a lot of actual academics here um from foreign countries that have made that that leap um i don't know if Hasig actually became a citizen here or not um are you familiar with him yeah the remember the kanji yeah yeah, yeah yeah so he he's um he's here and then there's another um american scholar donald king Yes. Yeah. Yes. He, he passed recently, right? Well, not only did he pass, I interviewed him a few years ago. Over email. Oh, so you, you've talked to him too. I've wow. So, to him. Yeah. yeah. So I wrote an uh, article of, on about him for Medium a few years ago. But, okay. Uh, yeah. No, I interviewed him in uh, 2015 when I was a high school student. So he was very kind and patient with me, you know, dumb kids like dumb questions about, you know, Japan and that kind of stuff. But I mean, looking at the correspondence, I did ask some questions that I'm happy that I got answers to. Right. And I, right, and yeah. I, and, and I wrote like a good, uh, good email, uh, a good article about based off our email correspondence to him. And, okay. you know, a scholar like him, he's somebody who's basically he talks to you the same way, whether you're a high school student or you're an esteemed scholar of, you know, Japanese literature. And, I think, you know, somebody like him who has that, like, you know, unfiltered love of Japan, who, you know, from that, you know, post-war era where he like actually fought in the war and then he also, mm. or served in the U.S. military and then, you know, was there for the reconstruction and everything. Yeah. You know, that generation is almost gone. There, There's very few of them that are still left. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's, um, that's great. You've, you know, you've been able to speak with, with someone of, of his, um, his caliber i say that because yeah. you know these these people have they were in japan as non-japanese before it was cool you know what i mean so <laughs> like yeah um, OGs. yeah yeah and you know i've 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 spoken with people who've been here since the early 80s late 70s you know and um they they went they lived through the bubble times and so oh. like just just speaking to that i thought was fascinating to to know what it's like to live in japan during those times like being an even just an English teacher in Japan during the the bubble era was, you know, you're you're bringing home, you know, four million, uh, more than that. You're you're bringing, um, you know, about four four thousand dollars a month or plus. You know, <laughs> <I> wish. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, that that's it's it's way less now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll just say that. So, um, but during that time, that that was a crazy time in Japan, and you know, because it was just booming here. Yeah, you know, no, inter no internet either, and very few resources to learn Japanese compared to everything you have now. Right, right, and um, there's a really interesting guy on YouTube. He he was like a like a J vlogger before vlogging was even a thing. Like, um, I think it's um, he's a give me a break, man. No, no, no. Th this guy was in Japan. He's been in Japan at least since the late '80s, and he would just take this old camcorder and just record. Mm -hmm. Like he has a few 
you know, looking at the camera, speaking moments, but mostly it's just him recording like B-roll footage of walking through Shinjuku or, or, or something in like 1991, you know, and yeah. um, uh, I, I'm subscribed to him on YouTube. He, and he still uploads videos to this day, even, oh. even from the eighties, nineties, two thousands, and even now, like 2021, he, he has videos up. So um, something Hiroshi Saxon, I think is his name, but uh, okay. yeah. Well, so I, I have a few yeah. thoughts on on J vloggers. I don't know if you share the same way, but you know. It, yeah. Um, well, they're 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 an interesting group. Uh, I I have to admit, I tried to tried my hand in it, you know, some years ago, and I just never could get in, get into it. But I I have met a lot of them, and um, yeah. yeah good. Well, you see, well, the thing the thing is, like with them, I'm sure they're nice people, and I'm sure they enjoy mm -hmm. what they're doing. But mm -hmm. somebody like abroad in Japan, for example, I view him as more just a doc, someone who makes documentaries instead right. of somebody who really represents what life is like in Japan. You know, for the mm -hmm. average person, because keep in mind, these YouTubers, especially people of his caliber, they're bringing in like money that is way higher than what the average like English teacher would make, for example. Right. And exactly. He yeah. has sponsors. He has like you know partnerships and everything, and uh, you know he's a very good filmmaker, and I appreciate the work that he does. But what I'm afraid of is that most foreigners are going to like watch this stuff and they think oh yeah this is what life is like for like you know every foreigner that comes to japan and i just mm -hmm. don't think that's the case right and there's another one i think it's life where i'm from or something and um, i think he's canadian and he he lives in japan and he just documents his daily life with his family you know and mm -hmm. so it's not really vlogging it's just not j vlogging it's just his life as a canadian who just happens to be in japan you know what i mean so thing channels like that i think are more they do better for people than the ones, you know, just going on about their anime fuku bukuro or, yeah. you know, all, or all like, like the, the tons of filters over the camera and everything. Yeah. And, you know, and sparkly effects and all that. And, you know, some people, if that's what gets them their joy, I'm not going to you know complain that's just it's not my thing I, I like i said i tried to to do it and i tried to do something a little bit different with it and i just it wasn't i mean i, I had some videos that were actually quite popular but I, I just um i wasn't feeling it you know i said to me it felt like i was trying to fake something that i wasn't and um, yeah. i didn't like that feeling so i just yeah. i deleted it all i just started over you know so youtube is a commitment that i don't think everybody you know is you know capable of doing and you know i was really surprised because so my brother actually uh made his first youtube video about uh, super mm -hmm. mario 64 uh, speedrunners blind speedrunners like faking faking runs mm -hmm. this is his first video he got over like almost 5 million views on his first video awesome well, that's, gr that's yeah. great and so i mean that's like something that like you know there's people who they spend literally years on the platform trying to get something like that and he got it on his first shot he got so a viral yeah he got a... <laughs> yeah and so like uh, for some people you know they just they're they're into it like you know immediately they know what they're doing and you know they're able to get that audience and others you know it's more it's more difficult but like for me personally Personally, I've always been more of like an academic type of sort. I've always been more interested in like writing and all that. Mm. And, you know, occasionally doing podcasts like this one, like, a, a, you know, talking to people, giving my perspective. But right. in terms of like making YouTube content regularly or even making my own podcast regularly, that's a commitment that I just don't think I have the time for at this stage, especially when you're a graduate student like me who has to have tons of assignments and, you know, is always planning ahead academically. Yeah. I mean, obviously where your priorities, priorities lie, you know, um, for me, I enjoy just doing this because it's it does bring me you know um, joy to do it you know um and I, I think i found something that that works for me in that respect and now i i only do one if i feel there's a reason for me to do it you know i um i know people say well you got to be consistent when you do something and you know but i'm i'm against the the principle of putting something out just to put something out mm -hmm. you know because it's like, um, that's a mentality of quantity over quality, you know, and I, I would prefer to just create something and not just podcasts or, but anything that I create, yeah. I want to have a purpose behind it and not just to do it, you know? Yeah. So it's very, it's the thing is like the, you know, constant quality, well, constant uploads and also constant quality. That's a very rare combination that I think few people mm. do. There's one, uh, you might be familiar with him on Patreon, a uh, Colin's last stand, Colin Moriarty. He does, yep. uh, mm -hmm. he's, I think might, he might, he's either number two or number one in terms of like gaming podcast. He does like, I think three or four shows every week. And it's always on like the day that he says it's going to come out on. He is like yeah. almost never skipped a week. And like when he does skip a week, he gives like his viewers, like, you know, 
know, I think a week, a week's notice hmm. in advance or something. Even when so. he moved across the country or something at yeah. one point too. Yeah. I was, on, so. I was actually on his podcast too. Uh, Were you? Few, okay. Few I'll have to for, check that out. It yeah. was for the uh, fireside chats, which he doesn't do anymore. But oh, yeah. the, that was at the, um, that wasn't the PlayStation one, was it? Or... It was the one where he was, he would talk to like his viewers or just interesting people. And he did okay. that for, he did that for, I think two years. And so yeah. he doesn't do it anymore, but I was on there when he, when he did okay. it. Okay. And now, yeah, yeah. I, actually, wow, um, I, that's that's cool. Because um, yeah, I followed Colin for a while. Um, um, I need to need to follow him again because um, I'm not sure. I think I just had a different Twitter account or something. But yeah, uh, no, Colin, yeah. I, so I support him on Patreon, and he responds to every <laughs> message that gets sent to him. And you know <laughs> that can't be you know uh, you know easy thing to do with, with the amount of like following that he has. But he takes the time to really talk to his fans. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I've I've always been appreciative of his work. I mean, even you know, back when he was, you know, part of the, the mainstream gaming sites, you know, yeah. and so, you no, know, I, I respect him too, because he's somebody that like broke off from like, you know, the hive mind of what games journalism was. And he just said, yeah, okay, I'll just do my own thing then. And, you know, I don't need, I don't need you. I can do this myself. And he did. Yep. And he did. And he did. And that was, that was good. And I know he had like some falling out with some of his former colleagues. Well, cause they all abandoned, <laughs> abandoned pretty him, much. Actually. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's that whole, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, again, getting into, you know, that, that was like the early days of kind of cancel culture, cancel you know, culture. Yeah, yeah. So. I've, I've talked about cancel culture like a few times on Twitter, mm. but yeah. yeah, but I mean, you know, that mentality, it's always existed among human beings. It's never, it's not the idea of like mob mentality or mob justice. It's always existed. It's just that it's easier than ever to do now. And, but it's, it's just sad when it's from people that you think are your allies and yeah. they would rather protect themselves against the mob than to stay loyal to a friend you know yeah. so it shows where their true loyalties it, lie so it's funny there's people who say well cancel culture doesn't exist for like you know rich privileged celebrities well sometimes it can actually in more ways than you expect but mm. when they talk about cancel culture they're mostly just talking about the average person that doesn't have that kind of following or that kind of influence right. where you know you say something that's misconstrued the wrong way or maybe it's not even offensive at all and just people like take it as offensive and then that person's life is ruined forever or at least in the long term yeah and, th and there's a fine line too because you also could be just you don't have to worry about cancel culture if you're a nobody you know like yeah. there's some, some people who don't um they just don't have the the following to for people to care about it you know to but like it it does it has in a sense, ruin some people, you know, um, for example, um, some comedians still have not been able to come back yeah. from that, like Louis CK is just now starting to, but he's still kind of off, you know, like, yeah. you don't really hear too much about him or um, um, who was the guy, the, um, the comedian that he didn't even, his is probably like, one of the weakest arguments against the Me Too thing. And he's just disappeared completely. Uh, Aziz, uh, Aziz well, Azar, yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe. There's also, I think, mm. comedian Dave Smith. He also has gotten into like hot water many times too. Oh, but Dave Smith, he's he's you know, he doesn't care. He he just yeah. lets it slide <laughs> off his back, you know. So he he seems to be doing all right for himself. Yeah. But in, it, in terms it, of that, so. the thing is, in all honesty, though, that is one one reason why I'm more interested in academia in Japan than I am in America. Because you know, in Japan, there's still debate. There's still it's still possible to have like you know, spirited debate about like different sides of an argument when especially in the humanities when as opposed no. to back in like a most western academia there is no debate you know it's like they make these like big claims and they say this is actually the truth and if you go against this you know you're the enemy or you know mm -hmm. you're a problematic individual and i don't like that direction that it's going in yeah and some some of the words that they use like the word uh, problematic or something like yeah. okay you know you're using loaded language against people mm -hmm. that's it's it's sort of like um the language that you use to talk about somebody already has a inherent bias behind behind yeah. it like and that's what i find a lot in modern journalism is mm -hmm. you'll see headlines like just an example like um you know uh, something that trump did of course it's going to have a negative thing to it when I, actually if you read the article the article itself is more objective than the headline you know <laughs> what i mean yeah. so oh oh actually that's what he did but um you know but in in also it's it's Okay, I, I would say this. I don't know if this is if the direction journalism has gone is better or worse. But remember the time when clickbait mm -hmm. headlines were every everywhere. You know, the, like the BuzzFeed school of journalism, like the right and all that. Yeah, yeah, that was annoying. But it it had a bit of it was annoying, but it didn't have the insidiousness that a lot of yeah. 
well, uh, journalism I'm, has no. You I'm, know? Cer- I'm certainly more aware of that now, especially because I am the social media editor for uh, mm-hmm. you know, a very respected website. About so NK News, uh, that's a job that I did. Uh, I just got that job like in October, so only a couple months in. But you know, along the way, I really learned how to like properly title stuff and how to get people. You, you, the thing is, you have to get people to click the article, but in a way that doesn't sound like you know that you click the article, yeah. click yeah. clickbaity. But it has to also be interesting too, because if it's like bland or boring, no one is going to care. So right. there is a there is a fine balance, and I do think that social media, you know, and that kind of stuff, that is a job that I think more companies need to hire people to do properly, and I think they're starting to realize that now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um... It's good that um, you're doing it from from Japan um, because you know the, the the probably I mean is your Japanese level high enough? Could you write articles in Japanese or would that just um, um, if they were if they were like highly edited? Yes, and if yeah. I had like you know the the chance. To, like, the thing is, my speaking is way better than my writing. It okay, always yeah, has yeah, been. So. Same, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I have like N two, and I'm aiming for N one within the next like one to two years, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then after that, actually, I want to try to get to Korean by the time I get to a postdoc because just okay. my uh, you know field. So right, that's that's the goal. But yeah, no, I, I, and I will say that I think uh, with like the social media like editing stuff, it's a very good opportunity for me to like talk to people in the field who are like North Korean academics and all that. Yeah. Well, uh, Oliver, uh, is it's been great talking to you. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for coming on. Um, where can we find you online? And uh, of course, you, you've you've said uh, who you uh, who you work with. Um, uh, give give us the uh, the deets, the details on uh, mm. on where we can find you online. Yeah, sure. So I think Twitter is probably the best uh, place to do that. So uh, the hashtag, uh, the username is uh, Oliver J J I A, and then uh, ten fourteen, so one zero one four. And okay. uh, yeah, no, po- I post updates regularly. That's how you and I, I think, uh, connected. That's uh, right. Yep. Such a, I don't know how long ago that was. Probably at least a couple, <laughs> maybe two. A years couple, ago. couple of years ago at, at this point, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. So, so well, it's also good, very good that we could uh, finally speak to each other and mm-hmm. uh, have have a very uh, nice and productive conversation. So, right. yeah. But anyways, you're always posting about my my work there. So, and then if a new article or anything comes up, you know, that's the, the first place we'll find out. Cool. So, so Twitter's the the place to find you, and of course, um, I'll, I'll put links to. Um, to sites that you write with too. Now you said you had a medium or do you still keep up with that? Uh, or, or no? Medium is only like occasionally it's been a while because just NK news stuff has taken time. So right. our website is nknews.org. Uh, it mm-hmm. is paywalled and it does require a subscription, but if you're interested in North Korea uh, news, anything like that, I think you'll find it worth, worth getting. I paid for it even bef- long before I was even working with them. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. So if you're in- yeah. So, uh, you know, support independent journalism and, uh, you know, we uh, really try to, do- we really try to do our best. Awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to like to speak to you again sometime as well. Yeah, Yeah, because there's whole other issues we didn't get to, like uh, gaming and movies. I I actually wanted to talk to you a lot about uh, movies because I've actually been in into movies. um, Yeah, since it'd be be nice to have uh, next time more lighter conversation. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you.